I'm I'm Anders. Uh, I'm I work at the um, Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research at the University of Copenhagen, and um, I'm presenting um, my own work uh, as a PhD and postdoc, and a bit of my group works um, on behalf of my supervisor Søren Brunak, and. Um, well, the title of the talk is Patient uh, Disease Trajectories, computed from big data sets uh, from healthcare sector. And uh, that's uh, my work, and that's the main thing I'll talk about. Um, so we live in the era of uh, precision medicine. Earlier, uh, you medicine was... Um, made for a broad group instead of um, specific tailored for one person it would fit everyone but now uh, we are moving more into um, tailoring the medicine um, to each individual person um, and uh, a large uh, building block in this is uh, the um, the sequencing of the uh, the human genome, um, where you go from from the smallest building block on and uh, work your uh, way up through c proteins and complexes uh, and tissues, um, and to investigate disease relations. So um, what I'm doing is uh, instead of a bottom uh, to top approach, I'm working at uh, data on the top, so to say, and. Um, there is a lot of um, data becoming available. Um, you have all these gadgets that will uh, now and in the future measure your health constantly. And um, there is a need for, uh, for models and uh, that can analyze all this data. Um, one uh, data set that uh, is available because all this data set is not really available for uh, research yet. Um, uh, all one data set that is available is, um, is the um, medical registry data and in Denmark we have um, what is called the National Patient Registry um, and that's available for research and um, the good thing about research in Denmark on these re uh, registries is that in essentially the, um, the whole country is your cohort because they are all registries um, are tied together with a central person identifying number. So um, all individuals living in Denmark uh, have one of those and you are able to track them through all hospitals and through the private practitioner and also get knowledge about where they live and how much they earn and who was their parents and are they married. So you get a lot of information um, about people in Denmark. Um, and the good thing is that it's, um, as long as it's uh, registry data, it's uh, fairly easy to um, get access to. Um, you can also uh, work with uh, data from electronic health records uh, where you they are a bit more tricky to get access to, but uh, still um, uh, in St. Brunach's group, uh, we have been working on, on uh, large data sets from electronic health records. And, and just to s briefly say that electronic health records is um, the health records that the hospitals use when they treat the patient. So they are primarily um, th in place to facilitate treatment of patients but um, they can also be used for research. And, and things that you have I um, in them are, are things such as, um, such as uh, the diag diagnosis, uh, data on which medicine the patient have taken, uh, m different measurements like weight and um, uh, cholesterol, cholesterol level and uh, then also uh, s clinical notes and um, the clinical notes they are uh, the the texts that doctors and nurses write to communicate with each other so uh, they are not uh, structured and it requires uh, text mining to get um, to get data out of them so what i'll be talking about um to today is uh, first of all I will introduce uh, large-scale comorbidity analysis. 
I will then uh, talk about my uh, work with uh, disease trajectories that I have um, condensed from 6.2 million Danes using the uh, National Discharge Registry. And, and then I will talk about um, um, two other projects, one text mining of electronic health records from other members of my group, uh, one on comorbidities and one of uh, an adverse drug reactions. So to start out, I will talk a bit about the basics, namely disease comorbidity or disease correlations. So uh, this if a patient has have um, two diseases, um, they are said to be comorbid. Sometimes you define comorbid as one of the disease has to be um, chronic, um, but in the broad sense, it's just that um, that the patient has two um, diseases, and um, and if, if you look at uh, if you investigate the diseases and figure out that two diseases are, are in the same patients, not just as you would expect by random chance, but uh, um, they they are more or they are overrepresented together, then uh, there might be uh, different explanations to it. So uh, some first uh, obvious explanation is like something like a age and gender and smoking. So if you see uh, lung cancer and uh, obstructive uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, that smoker's lungs, uh, popular um, th then then it is likely to both be uh, uh, caused by smoking but uh, but you can find other diseases that you cannot uh, explain trivially by um, by confounding factors and they might um, be um, uh, explained by uh, some genetics um, it might be that there's one causing gene or several genes working together in complexes and um, so on. So in some sense, you can uh, some of the disease correlations will be driven by the genetics. Um, um, and also, uh, you the patient uh, has other diseases, um, and uh, uh, other diseases will of course influence uh, on uh, could be on, on each of these diseases and um, could be an explain explaining factor. So how do you um, measure this? So you um, so you could look at, for instance, is there a correlation between gout and atherosclerosis? Um, then uh, to investigate this, you would go and ask uh, people, do you have gout, do you have atherosclerosis, or do you, and then you can conclude if they have both. And then um, you look at the people um, who have uh, had both and look if uh, they are overrepresented. So there are uh, some different ways of doing it. And um, one is uh, the measure of relative risk. Sorry. And uh, relative risk in uh, um, could be defined as uh, what you have observed. So how many you observed divided by how many you would expect. Um, and uh, that could be the random expectation, say that um, there, they are, there's no correlation. Then you, uh, when when it's one in hundred who has one disease and one in ten who has a other disease, then you would expect one in thousand to have both diseases. So that could be a random um, expectation. Or you could define a control group. So you say have a case group and a control group, and you you take the um, the occurrences or the frequencies and divide it. Then you get the the relative risk. So the higher the relative risk is, uh, the more uh, co positively correlated they are. And if it's below one, it's and and it's never larger than zero, uh, less than zero, um, then then it's uh, they are negatively correlated. So um, how to obtain data on um, all uh, on diseases, um, as I mentioned, um, we have um, the Danish National Patient Registries. Um, in Denmark, all uh, patients, or all citizens are uh, covered by the national uh, health insurance. So um, most Danes, or the majority of Danes, they go to public hospitals. So, so this uh, gives a really good coverage of the, the um, patient's hospital history. 
and uh, we have uh, uh, a, a data set with all patients for almost 15 years when we did the analysis and now we have extended this to 18 years and we it, it was it we now have 6.6 .6 million patients and 88 million um patient diagnosis associations so so this is uh, a kind of big data and um, the diseases are diagnosed in uh, the international classification of diseases um, so version 10 from uh, for all our data set so the this uh, registry was started in uh, 1977 and uh, and the a unique thing is that there that was already back then uh, digital uh, reporting so so um, so there has been uh, continuous continuously uh, digital reporting for a very long time we took not the full set but the set that was covered by version 10 of the ICD-10 um, uh, because uh, because uh, otherwise you need to convert between uh, different classifications and uh, since they have a fundamental different structure this is um, this is hard so in the version 10 of ICD um, you have uh, uh, 22 chapters so like infectious diseases cancers and um, diseases of the circulatory system and uh, you have diagnosis um, for example i10 uh, is essential hypertension and uh, and this uh, i have colored uh, purple because it's uh, in this chapter so these two colors go together um, and how does the data then look from the um, um, registry this is uh, a fictive example we have an identifier of a person we know it's a male we know when he was born and we know when he died and then um, for the data i'm working on we basically have a discharge state of a um, of a hospital encounter and uh, some diagnosis that the patient had so this patient had uh, hyperplasia of prostate that's a large prostate then this turns out later to be prostate cancer uh, he later fractures his arm have some obstructive uropathy that's because he uh, the c he cannot um, pee uh, and uh, then essential hypertension I mean, anemia so um, and if you take a bit broader look at um, what's in the data um, I have here plotted a, a stratified all diagnosis in men and women and uh, ages here and if they were inpatient outpatient and emergency room patient outpatient they are the ones who uh, come to the hospital and leave the same day so something that you're going to a checkup and some people they are outpatients all their life um, so um, what you see here is for instance that uh, there are birth codes and um, uh, they uh, it's the women who give birth and it's uh, like between 20 and 40 you have them and uh, you both have inpatient and outpatient um, birth codes um, and in Denmark it's like when you give birth the second time after six hours if nothing is uh, went wrong with the birth you get uh, sent home from the hospital and um, uh, so 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 there's there's like a slightly shift in the peak of uh, outpatient birth compared to inpatient birth um, and also there are a lot more uh, codes here um, then you have uh, the injuries like broken arm alcohol intoxications and so on and uh, it's the uh, brave young men who um, get the uh, m most um, injuries and um, you can see a slight um, bump for elderly women which might be because of uh, they get uh, fragile bones later and um, then you have uh, cancer uh, which uh, comes later in life um, and um, there's a lot of these diagnoses in the the Danish National Patient Registry
So I, as I said, I analyzed uh, I, I, one way of analyzing the data is using this relative risk, and then um, then you can do we did this for all diseases against all diseases, uh, uh, and um, then you get um, a large scale comorbidity anal analysis, which when you look at the first time would look something like this if you want to make a network out of it. Everything is uh, very highly connected and uh, it's very confusing to look at. Um, so how to draw some conclusions from this. So um, we did some clustering of all these um, analysis. So here you see uh, there are 19 different uh, clusters. The, so each circle is a cluster and then they, they are even clustered uh, once again for um, layout purposes, but um, two diseases uh, diseases are in the same cluster if they um, have a high relative risk with each other. So, uh, but um, and um, maybe less re high relative risk with other diseases. So, so um, that is if we zoom in on on four clusters. Uh, they are the clusters which contain mental and behavioral disorders, and because this is somatic data, they uh, they uh, cluster together. So, um, so um, so th so this means that when one patient had one of these um, uh, ICD-10 codes, uh, uh, the patient was very likely to get the other ICD-10 codes. Um, and what interesting conclusions can you draw from this? Well, it's not that interesting to see that a lot of um, of um, psychiatric diagnosis uh, goes together, but it's uh, it's nice to see that they do because it confirms your model. Uh, but um, there might be other diagnoses uh, such as there's some infectious diseases here, uh, which might be because they are or some of them might be drug addicts and then they get infectious diseases. Um, or and there's uh, some circulatory system diseases here, and these might be uh, of a novel interest. So, so you m you might say that having one disease will increase the risk of having the other. So there might be some mechanistic um, thing going on, um, making it worthwhile um, doing further research on uh, on these um, these pairs of diseases. So uh, this was uh, like going uh, using pairs of all against all diseases. We also did a, um, a, a large scale study and uh, this was really large scale. Um, bec it was uh, on Mendelian and complex diseases. And in this study we uh, collaborated with uh, Andrei Wetzke um, from uh, the US and uh, also a lot of other people like David Blair was the main author um, and we got analyzed the data for 110 million patient and um, and then we had data from the US and from Denmark so here uh, the the um, idea of this study is that it has been observed that uh, some rare Mendelian diseases um, they uh, uh, have uh, some complex diseases as comorbidities very often. So, for instance, patients with Huntington's disease they get diabetes uh, more often than you would expect, and um, this might be um, explained by uh, um, that they share some common genetics, and. Um, it's interesting to find uh, uh, genetics for uh, com complex diseases because uh, they are complex so that they don't have um, much that they that could be many explanation as to to uh, the genetics of complex diseases and um, it's mendelian diseases are really well studied and complex diseases are not um, that easy to study so so uh, that's why it's interesting to find uh, information on them. Uh, but then you can go, uh, there's a database called Online Inheritance, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. 
and there you can get information on Mendelian diseases and, and the genetics and then you can also um, so you can figure out which uh, genetic loci is associated with the disease then you can go on and uh, find out if they overlap with the uh, diabetes uh, for instance and then uh, this this um, So, um, uh, no, we don't um, use uh, use extra information and I it's a um, somewhat naive uh, thought that everything uh, could be explained by, uh, by these um, uh, com comorbidities and, be and that everything should be a genetic, um, um, in a cellular genetic uh, cause, but, um, but uh, but what we have done is uh, doing a large uh, scale analysis where we come up with candidates and of course when you come up with with candidates you you need to investigate further and to see if 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 such two diseases could easily be explained by um something like uh, metabolism mm -hmm. and something having nothing to do with the the genetics that you found in um umim so 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 what we uh, the result of this study was um, was that uh, we have a we found a wide range of um, mendelian diseases and the selection of these mendelian diseases was primarily done um, uh, with the limitations of uh, the uh, classification of diseases so it's not uh, all diseases that are specified enough in the ICD uh, to say that uh, this is one disease. Um, so, so they were uh, selected among those where we were able to do that. And then uh, we tested them against a wide range of, uh, of different um, complex diseases such as cardiovascular, immune, neurological and uh, cellular pr population diseases. And uh, what we uh, found was that um, that we we uh, that there was a lot of um, comorbidities which were significant, and if we um, if we s sort them out, um, then uh, then we could uh, for each uh, complex disease there would be a different pattern of Mendelian diseases that uh, they uh, had high comorbidity with and um, we did uh, also a GWAS enrichment um, study where it was shown that uh, approximately uh, we had an enrichment of um, of complex loci by two twofold to what you expect by random chance um, and of course um, th a lot of these things are not driver genes and they are not the the main cause of the genes, but they they might be be mutations that uh, push the disease in this uh, uh, in a certain direction. So um, that this is then another um, more hypothesis driven way of uh, of doing large scale data analysis. And um, and then what more can we learn from the of um, of uh, correlations. Well, um, f from the hairball, you could.
draw uh, two quite non-random diseases. Uh, that's this chronic hepatitis, uh, viral hepatitis, and malignant neoplasm of the liver, um, and they they are highly correlated. And um, as far as my medical knowledge uh, goes, um, it, the, it's, it's clear that uh, that uh, hepatitis, um, liver hepatitis, or chronic viral hepatitis causes liver cancer, um, and uh, and and. And by that we didn't learn much, but then you can go on and um, continue looking at what else could be causing um, liver cancer. Well, then there's a range of mental and behavioral disorders uh, that also are highly correlated with this. And then you could think, hmm, is there a, a disease mechanism? Uh, going on here? But uh, in fact, it, it seems more likely that... that um, that they, that the patients uh, who ha are addicted to opioids uh, get uh, um, hepatitis infections and thereby get cancer. So, um, and this you cannot uh, um, resolve by only looking at uh, non-temporal diagnosis and only looking at diagnosis like pairwise uh, to to figure out such things that it could be like this. Uh, um, you need uh, to look at diseases in a temporal fashion and uh, this uh, we uh, call disease trajectories so this could qualify as being a disease trajectory that that you see patients moving from from this disease to that disease and going there and there are multiples way of getting uh, chronic uh, getting to chronic viral hepatitis and of course it's it's not like a genetic causative chain um, this is uh, external um, behavior um, that causes you to be in a high risk group for getting um, hepatitis and then hepatitis uh, increase your risk for liver cancer so um, well this uh, is uh, this is well known and uh, this was something that I uh, not an example that I actually confirmed that there are a lot of patients having this trajectory, but um, but but how do we find more of them? So this is like where we do um, disease trajectories, and uh, um, I have uh, uh, um, like medical history of uh, 6.2 million patients um, when I did this, and now more. And they and if if this represents time and each of these uh, thing uh, uh, represents a disease um, that you had, then for instance this could uh, be uh, type two diabetes in in yellow. Then you could sync all the the type two diabetes to to start at the same time and then look which diseases did we see. Uh, before and which diseases did we see after the um, the type two, and can we build change like like you get diabetes, you get problems with the foot, uh, and then you get amputations, um, and can we do this in a systematic way, and um, and what we did uh, if we go back to the um, the patient here we had this cancer patient we can also visualize it in like here that he gets uh, cancer and uh, new hyperplasia cancer and breaks arm and so on um, so you have uh, 6.2 million of these individual trajectories um, and then the your task is to find which are the um, the ones that you see in many patients, the the ones uh, uh, which are significant, and um, uh, what is irrelevant, like uh, the fracture of the upper arm, that uh, is hardly relevant for um, your cancer um, progression. So to do this, we went back at um, and at the um, pairwise level, and we tested. Uh, 400 and 
and 45,000 comorbid pairs of diseases um, in both directions. So, so we tested if one disease uh, occurred uh, significantly more before the after the other one or before for the other one. So um, and and then we uh, calculated relative risk, um, where we also uh, corrected for factors uh, such as age and gender um, to make sure that it, the correlations that we see are not a product of that. And uh, we ended up in with uh, 62,821 significant uh, pairs of diseases, where there's an increased Rel significantly increased relative risk, um, and these can be decomposed into 21,000 bidirected pair and 20,000 single directed pair. So 21,000 where it goes like this both ways significantly, and 20,000 where it go doesn't isn't significant. And then we to uh, identify diseases where there's a strong temporal um, uh, aspect of them. We identified 4,000 diseases where where one, where if you're in this case, one would one would primarily come before or after the other, like not only that they had an increased risk, uh, but also that they s that one would significantly come before the other. And then we uh, from these uh, 4,000 pairs, we started to build our trajectories. And we started uh, by a simple combination. So we start out by having uh, a uh, these 4,000 pairs, and then you can see the, the end match here, and then you combine them into to length three. And of course, saying that that there are many patients who have A, then B, and B, then C doesn't imply that there are many patients who have the, the full length. Um, so we uh, counted them and sorted out the ones which uh, didn't have any patients or had few patients, and then we we iterated again to making length four trajectories. And we also went longer and looked at length five trajectories. They the generally they were uh, um, variants of each other, so so that it would be the same length four, and then a fifth one changing, and the fifth one could also be represented as as the fourth one. So, so there wasn't. Uh, so the data that we have doesn't have long enough time span to actually capture more than um, four uh, diseases in a row um, using uh, our methods. So, um, in the end, we identified uh, 1,171 trajectories um, with. Uh, uh, more than 20 patients in the last step. So, uh, of course, if you start by having 100,000 here, then then that will not be all 100,000 going on to the next step, and uh, there will be even less uh, for the last step. Um, and then um, we, in order to be able to visualize these 1,171 trajectories, we uh, performed uh, um, Markov clustering of them and uh, clustered them into five major patterns. So the clustering, that was a way to break down the diagnosis to uh, so that we could visualize them. That it was, wasn't uh, a result that we claimed that they were somehow specially connected. One cluster was this really small and simple cluster of um, hyperplasia of prostate leading to prostate cancer. So we start out by having 14,000 roughly going here, and then um, less and less uh, going to the, the later steps. Um, and in order to uh, not have a visualization that's 1,100 of these uh, scrolling down, um, then we we uh, put nodes together so that we put all these nodes together into one node, and all these into one node, and so on, the, these ones into an node and these ones into one node. And then in the end, we have a network like this, where, where like time flows in this direction. And, um, and then the width of the um, arrows here correspond to the pairwise um, number of people who had one disease than the other one. And we c 
we cannot show all the the different um, trajectories in this one so that so when you draw a figure like this there might be be more than uh, length four trajectories and you cannot show which one are actually covered by how many patients in this visualization because it would there would be too many overlapping links with different counts but um, but you can show something like this and this is um, the cardiovascular diseases um, and um, uh, this was one of the, the bigger clusters that we found um, and uh, the cardiovascular diseases some start with uh, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, and then move into to acute myocardial infarctions and some start with uh, angina pectoris which is pain in the chest um, and move on and um, and it's seen that um, most people who have the, the starting diseases and less people who have uh, the latter diseases and uh, and one um, uh, thing that we uh, found in this network was that uh, that gout uh, is a, um, a very prominent disease. It uh, was, was central in, uh, in in not only this network, but uh, but also it was re uh, really central diagnosis. And gout is uh, also I don't. It, it's when you, when you are um, when you are uh, the uric acid starts to uh, crystallize and they uh, gather in your joints and apparently. Uh, often in the the big toe, um, and uh, and then then that hurts. But actually, it seems uh, that it, it's uh, it's a play it's a central diagnosis in the uh, cardiovascular diseases, and this has been discussed. So it it might be that it's a cause of uh, uh, medicine, uh, the treatment that you get, or it might be have other causes but our data indicates that uh, that you you get this uh, um, in your um, cardiovascular disease and all not only that you get this but when when you get it you increase your chance of um, of getting all, all all the other diseases which follows and one of the other diseases is cardiac arrest and obviously that's something you would like to avoid um, so uh, so, so th this result could could be used in, like, say, being a warning, saying that when you have gout, you should be on the lookout uh, for getting cardiac arrest. It doesn't mean, of course, doesn't mean that when you get gout that you necessarily uh, get cardiac arrest. Luckily, um, but. Um, it could also be used to, um, if you are do making uh, clinical trials, you want to see, well, I want to investigate patients who have card who are in the high risk of getting cardiac arrest. I want to investigate which treatments um, uh, uh, are better against it. And then you want to identify patients who are likely to get cardiac arrest because cardiac arrest is, is luckily n not nothing you, you see in, in all your patients. Um, well, we all die at some point, but um, um, but uh, there might be other diseases also that you you that's rare. But if you can find a a a disease where you can say if I take all gout patients and and give them this tr intensive treatment, uh, then I I might actually is, uh, see a, a a difference in the risk of cardiac arrest. So we also found another trajectory group which uh, was uh, the uh, colma, uh, the smoker's lung con chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, and uh, and this is um, then the disease networks for all the smokers and um, and uh, it, once you get COPD you get a increased risk of getting so many diseases so uh, I would strongly advise you not to smoke um, so um, so so what what we can uh, can see here is that uh, there are some cardiovascular diseases leading up to it um, but um, but some of these diseases might actually be caused by your COPD 
So so that that what you see in the hospitals is that people could come with uh, with angina pectoris and atherosclerosis, and then later they get diagnosed with COPD. And this is of course unfortunate because if you knew that patient had COPD, you could. Uh, give them treatments earlier and actually when we were writing this paper uh, there was another paper um, saying that uh, COPD is um, is uh, is under treated uh, and um, and this is uh, in in this sense uh, we on un- these trajectories can be used to uncover like a bottleneck diagnosis and diagnosis that um, that are um, that indicates that something is wrong because um, when you see things not in the biological order occurring in these disease trajectories, you might uh, want to check into why do don't we catch them in the correct order? Why don't we catch the COPD patients before they have the um, um, side effects? So for my trajectory analysis, um, you could say that uh, that it's a roadmap uh, of disease progression, and uh, and usage of the roadmap is like to identify key diseases in disease progression, like gout was a key, and um, COPD was a key diagnosis, and then uh, you can use this as a platform project in future outcome of diseases, and also uh, to uh, like in the last example shown here to identify high risk patients um patients of high risk of dying or so so next i will uh, talk uh, shortly about uh, the text mining of uh, electronic health records and uh, that was done by uh, francesco rook and uh, peter Bustrup. Um and uh, and the data sources that uh, Saran has in his group are the St. Hans Psychiatric Hospital and the Steno Diabetes Center. So this is the largest psychiatric hospital in Denmark and this is the largest diabetes center in Denmark. Um, and uh, again, the data was like I shown earlier, you have diagnosis, drugs and uh, measurements and clinical notes um, among your data. So, um, uh, how does uh, hospital text look like? Well, um, there I- exists a lot of p- um, software to do text mining and to do um, like NLP, natural language processing, which is uh, assumes that you have um, correctly written sentences, but. Uh, um, Generally, clinical notes are not really that uh, correctly written. So they, um, so so we have um, done uh, something called, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, well, named entity recognition. So we we built a um, dictionary of ICD-10 terms, and we use ICD-10 as our a spaces for a dictionary because we have the other diagnosis in ICD-10 as well. So they could be terms like paranoid schizophrenia and uh, bipolar affective disorder and paranoia, asthma and so on. Um, and then uh, you want to have um, uh, you want to have synonyms and so on. So so there was also an effort made to 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 make synonyms to catch as many um diseases as possible so so then you run this computer program through the through the text and um and there are also uh, various issue that you should take care of like had never had hallucinations then the patient didn't have hallucinations and uh, and and the patient like pt uh, for short for patient mentioned his mother uh, so that he thinks has a has a social phobia. So in that case, you shouldn't assign uh, s- assign social phobia to the patient because it's uh, it's um, it's about the mother. So there are some technical issues that you have to deal with when um, when doing this. 
and um, and uh, uh, the result of this is that okay that's also one thing like um, like when you we also mine for drugs and uh, this is a probably fine drug name clozapine and uh, when doctors write it in the journals they are not that consistent so this is all uh, variants of how they they write it th that the C might be a CH and the Z uh, might be an S and so on and then there are a very many ways so so in order to capture all these ways you also have to uh, um, yeah to do some extended um, dictionary search so, so you cannot just just assume that all doctors write write the correct thing um and uh so what results came out of this is that first of all we did a deep phenotyping of patients um in in where we we here can see that that these are the diagnoses that are represented in the codes that uh, were reported to the hospital uh to the na yeah they they were co coded and reported to the national patient registry and and they all focus on chapter five of ICD-10, which is psychiatric disorders, so which is not uh, that surprising, but you you don't have many symptoms. If you mine the text, you get um, a large um, um, large amount of symptoms, and you also get um, other codes. So so you get a lot more information on the on the single patient than if you use the data which correspond to what would be sent to the national patient registry of course to get uh, um, it would be nice to uh, just do all your analysis on patient files but uh, but you also have to to get them and uh, that's not that easy um, so uh, with this uh, deep phenotyping um, there was um, a um, all against all disease correlation uh, done and um, and they uh, and here you have have like the complete spectrum of of uh, ICD-10 which uh, like the, the codes that were mined uh, or found at the hospital and uh, and you have the same codes here so this is a heat map uh, so and red means that there is a high correlation between diseases, and blue means that there is a low correlation uh, or a negative correlation. Like, it, like they are uh, found together less than you would expect. And then, if you do clustering, you can along the axis find something such as uh, mental a cluster of uh, mental and behavioral disorders, hard diagnosis, and so on. Um, showing that that diseases that you know to be connected or similar they they are in fact together and again if you want to draw interesting conclusions from this um, you need to to look at uh, what is unexpected here and um, and this um, might be a bit difficult if you have thousands of um, of correlations to look through and um, then uh, you also uh, had a clustering of patients um, in a uh, based on the diseases that they share so instead of instead of uh, comparing the diseases based on shared patients you compare patient on shared diseases so and this cluster shows that uh, that um, there are, are different groups of patients, so uh, so there are different schizophrenia. So there are some schizophrenic patients here, and the larger distance, the the larger um, the si dissimilarity they have. So and there's another group of um, schizophrenic uh, patients here, and um, and this. Yeah, with this you can characterize your patient cohort and uh, um, identify subgroups with certain diseases. And 
um, so so you could enhance your patient similarity matrix if you like this is examples of words that are often represented in the the clusters like pain unhappy worried dizzy itchy th these ones dizzy and itchy they might be related to adverse drug reactions oh, and this is the adverse drug, drug reactions so so th this is like different groups of patients had had these words describing them um but and of course if if you just look at the single words uh, it's not that interesting you have to go to diseases uh, and um and and there's also ont ontologies for diseases where you can um look at uh, the similarity of the disease so for instance there's uh, snomed ct which is uh, uh, which has a hierarchical tree where you can actually measure uh, distance between diseases so from from your ontology you could say that how similar are these two diseases well they share a, a common uh, parent here so they have maybe one two three of a distance while while this uh, disease one two three four five six so this these are further apart so you, you can uh, enhance your um your correlation with this knowledge and then you can get a different clustering like here uh, there was something with alcohol abuse uh, brain damage uh, depression so you get uh, slightly different clusters um, and uh, and uh, it's uh, always a good idea to include uh, all the null a priori knowledge that you have such as knowledge from the um ontologies um because then then you uncover things that uh, then you don't discover things that you already knew so um lastly there was Robert Eriksson uh, he did a, uh, a study of adverse drug reaction on the same uh, patient corpora and uh, adverse drug reaction is that when you take a drug and you get a um, a re effect from that that is non desirable um, and uh, this is has a large impact on society there are like one million patients in Europe each year getting um, adverse drug reaction and it happens in five percent of all the hospitalizations and uh, there are um, they are costly to society so so what you want to do is um, drugs with too many um, adverse drug reactions you need uh, to um, to withdraw them um, and and uh, to in order to know which drugs to withdraw you have to uh, report the adverse drug reactions and um, they are not really systematically reported so uh, this might be a um, report for a um, adverse drug reaction and, um, and it's not uh, af after the cl clinical trials of a drug it's not that easy to um, to follow up on it it's uh, they they are reliable these reports but they are underreported it's biased what is reported and uh, there are some qualities in issue but then you can use text mining um, like uh, text mining of this um, big um, corpora or uh, this big uh, data set that we had um, so um, so we from the data we know uh, which uh, patient uh, had which drugs are uh, they just prescribed and the, you know the doses of the drugs so so um, so what uh, Uruba did was to in the days after the drug was given he monitored for patients for possible adverse drug reactions and then i mean first he built a um, uh, he, he figured out what is the drug supposed to do because obviously if a drug does what it's supposed to do it's not an adverse reaction so which are the known adverse drug reaction he also identified that and then there uh, is also the issue of um, of negative modifiers such as had not this re 
this um, drug adverse drug reaction or his brother had something um, so uh, the the pipeline for this is that uh, at, at this start of the treatment you first go back for the patient and remove symptoms that the patient already had um, or have, uh, problems that the patient already has because they will not if you see them again they are not likely to be new adverse drug reactions then you look at um, what other um, other outcome the patient had um, then some of them might be um, the the drug indications so that's good and some of them might be do what the patient already had some of them might be wrong and then you can fill it down to find something that might be a true adverse drug reaction and then it could be one which is already known and one which is new so with this data um, you can uh, um, of course not say that this is necessarily a a true uh, new uh, adverse drug reaction but this is a way of systematically um, monitoring patient for adverse drug reactions and uh, and collecting data that uh, that you cannot do without uh, having um, a computer system doing it for you S uh Uh, an, a lack of efficacy. No, I don't. Th as far as I know, I don't th uh, think that this was done. Um, so, so, w so it was only uh, uh, looked at um, what uh, actual reaction there was. Yeah, and then of course there are also s things like um, the the monitoring started at one day after the drug was prescribed because in the first day the doctor will uh, mention all the possible adverse drug reaction to the patient and confirm that the patient knows that it has this thing so they are mentioned in the journal and, if, um, and then if you didn't filter out them you would uh, see many adverse drug reactions so so what this study uh, found was that that you could actually reproduce um, the the uh, frequencies reported by the manufacturer in in how often uh, you would see a um, a uh, adverse drug reactions which is um, to some degree confirming um, the the approach and then uh, um, there was like a number of candidate um, uh, adverse drug reactions and now I I didn't uh, take notes on them so this is like some of the results which w where you um, of course um, it's not that now we found this now you must uh, say that visual impairment is a, a adverse drug reaction of this um, but uh, you might do further studies to con confirm that this is in fact the case but without this um, systematically monitoring, you would not be able to know which drugs uh, to do further examination of. So, so the list of the drugs is um, um, uh, is out in uh, Robert Eriksson's paper in in Jamia. Uh, no, in did this was the Jamia was the technical part and drug safety from 2014 is the um, is the um, would have the list of, of these drugs and um, and if you search for Robert Erickson and Sharon Brunak together in one paper y you will find a short list of uh, papers that where this is on so um, and in the end, uh, I will. Pres uh, the Rupert also made a like network of adverse drug reactions and uh, compared the um, 
drugs as to which adverse drugs reactions they shared. So these drugs are all uh, psycholeptic drugs, um, and they share um, or antipsychotic. They share the same side effects, and uh, these are antidepressants, and they also share the same side effects. And then there are some uh, uh, drugs such as laxative and antibacterial drugs for systemic use that that shares some um, some similar. Um, uh, adverse drug reaction, but this could be di. I mean, if you get uh, laxative, you will get diarrhea, and you might also get diarrhea from from um, from getting anti oh, um, from getting antibiotics. I mean, laxative is supposed to make things go smoother. So, so what uh, what the result was here um, was that um, was that. Um, that drug uh, they drug classes cluster together and uh, sort of the conclusions that can be drawn from the text mining analysis is that uh, that uh, that uh, that they can prov provide a deep phenotyping of the patient this deep phenotyping could among others be used to uncover disease comorbidities and um, disease correlations and used to identify possible adverse drug reactions for further use and um and then uh then i um, want to say thank you for listening and um i would like to acknowledge like san brunach was my supervisor and slash lenson was my second uh, my secondary supervisor and i had a lot of my colleagues who helped uh, help me and especially Pope and Tudor from University of New Mexico um, were very helpful for the trajectory studies and we have a different a range of different other collaborations and I'm founded by uh, Novo Nordisk Quanten and by Biomed Bridges founded by the EU and my um, PhD was founded by the Danish uh, Agency for Science, Technology and Innovation. <laughs>